you. Welcome everyone to the committee's data gathering open session. Um, I am the chair of the, the committee to reevaluate the energy requirements. And I would like for you to, um, to welcome you to this afternoon's open session where we'll be hearing from some experts. Um, this task is being undertaken by this committee of the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine to assess human requirements for energy intake and energy expenditure. This meeting is being held to gather information to help the committee conduct its study. That is, the committee is in the process of assembling materials that it will examine and discuss in the course of making its findings, conclusions, and recommendations. Therefore, I ask everyone here today to be mindful of the fact that the committee has made no conclusions and that it would be a mistake for anyone to leave here today thinking otherwise. Comments made by individuals, including members of the committees, should not be interpreted as positions of the committee or of the National Academies. In addition, committee members typically ask probing, probing questions in these information gathering sessions that may not be indicative of their personal views. The committee will deliberate thoroughly before writing its draft report. Moreover, once the draft report is written, it must go through a rigorous review by experts who are anonymous to the committee, and the committee then must respond to this review with appropriate revisions that adequately satisfy the National Academy's Report Review Committee and the NAS president before it's considered an official Academy report. Now, I would like to introduce um, and welcome our speakers for this afternoon. The first speaker, um, first set of speakers are Kelly Casabal, who is a senior nutrition advisor in the Office of Nutrition and Food Labeling at the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition of the US Food and Drug Administration. And Catherine Hopperton, who is a scientific evaluator in infant nutrition from the Bureau of Nutritional Sciences at Health Canada. They'll be presenting data on energy values in human milk. And then the final speaker is Dr. Leanne Redman, who is a professor of clinical science at Pennington Biomedical Research Center within the Louisiana State University system. She'll be presenting energy requirements to support weight gain in pregnancy and during lactation at different BMIs. So thank you very much for coming and presenting to the committee. And I just want to remind everyone that only the committee members will be asking questions at the end. So um, Dr. Casavell and Hopperton, please proceed. All right, great, thank you. And Dr. Ashley Vargas is actually going to help us with our slides today and um, pick, off, pick things off with a little bit of background information about the Human Milk Composition Initiative. So I'll hand it over to Ashley uh, briefly. Great, thank you, Kelly. Can you all see the correct slides? Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Good. Good, all right. My name is Ashley Vargas. I'm a program officer at NICHD, the Child Health Institute of NIH. And I am pleased on behalf of the Human Milk Composition Initiative of both US and Canada to be here today, along with our wonderful speakers. Just a quick background from me, and then we'll move right to the meat of it from Dr. Casavell and Dr. Hopperton. So the HMCI or the Human Milk Composition Initiative was formed um, in 2016, 2017 to support the coordination of human milk composition data in both the US and Canada and its development. The intention is for this data to be used by federal policy program and other stakeholders. Um, and so we're really grateful to have this opportunity to speak to the committee today. The overarching purpose of HMCI really is to support uh, the nutrition and dietary monitoring guidelines, education and other policy programs and regulations, kind of a mouthful, um, for both maternal child health and really family well-being. 
HMCI is um, co-led by multiple institutes across both US and Canada. Um, I'm the current US coordinator and my uh, co-coordinator is Sophie Parnell. And today we are joined by Dr. Kelly Casavell, who is the immediate um, prior co-US coordinator and the founder of HMCI, and Catherine Hopperton, who serves um, as a key member of the Health Canada team on HMCI. There's also support from other agencies listed here, including USDA and the Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion. Without much further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Kelly Casavell. We've already had introductions but for both her and Dr. Hopperton, and I will mute and go ahead and advance slides as asked. All right, we can move to the next slide. Thank you, Ashley. So today we were asked to come and talk about some of the data that we've come across over the last couple of years and data that will be coming soon that relates to energy values for human milk and how they can relate to uh, past or future DRIs. Next slide. So first, uh, in the spirit of the last day of Women History Month, I see it fitting that we share a little bit about the inspiring life of Dr. I.C. Macy. Um, I didn't know about Dr. Macy. Um, many of you might who have a longer history in human milk than I do, um, but she was an American biochemist who did research in human nutrition, specifically pertaining to mothers and children. She faced a lot of discrimination because of her gender, um, but. Despite that, she received her doctorate from Yale and became the first woman chair of the local section of the American Chemical Society. She's won many, many awards and is responsible for many of um, the policies, the data supporting many of the policies that we still rely on heavily today. Um, so I'm, I'm her fan and club of one. Next slide, please. So the composition of human milk um, that underpins the DRIs is mostly from studies in the 70s and 1980s. Um, and it's provided the basis for most of the DRIs for infants as the sole reference for infants from zero to six months and a combination of estimates of nutrient exposures for older infants. Um, this is the case for all of the nutrients for which there are adequate intakes and for the EARs for zinc and iron um, with additional considerations for iron. And then the primary exception for this um, is human milk uh, is not the basis for the ERIs or RDAs, of course, for protein. And just to note that we have no acceptable macronutrient distribution ranges um, for infants. And the data that I'm going to be talking about today are the citations that are the basis for most of those DRIs for infants, which is 75 kilocalories per 100 milliliters and um, the basis for the DRI for energy during lactation, which is about 69 kilocalories per milliliter. Next slide. So this slide is just a rudimentary summary of how most of those adequate intakes are uh, described in the DRI reports. For zero to six months, it's essentially the mean nutrient composition of human milk itself. And then for older infants in seven to 12 months of life, it's that concentration for human milk plus a value that's identified for complementary foods and beverages. Next slide. So when determining uh, adequate intakes for older infants shown here on this slide, seven to 12 months of age, first the energy content of human milk was used to determine the calorie content for 600 milliliters per day of human milk, the volume of human milk assumed to be consumed in the second half of infancy. And then the caloric density of human milk, which is stated in the DRI reports to be 75 kilogram calories per 100 milliliters. Um, and that's stated in a number of reports, including under the discussions for selenium and chromium. And then the estimated calories from human milk is then determined to be 450 kilocalories per day. Now then that value is subtracted from the average caloric intake value for older infants that's used in the DRIs, which has been 845 kilocalories per day. And that arrives at 395 calories that are available and needed for complementary foods. So then you take the mean estimated, um, the mean estimates in human milk that are um, in 600 milliliters um, of human milk and then complementary foods that provide 395 calories using the mean estimate nutrient concentration for human milk and for complementary foods and beverages respectively to arrive at the adequate intake. Um, and this is a, the calculation that's rather consistently used across those adequate intake calculations. Next slide. So from that, you can see that the caloric value that's used for human milk is one of those key factors underpinning those adequate intake values. 
um, as well as that mean concentration value that was determined for each of the nutrients for human milk and for complementary foods and beverages. And essentially those AIs are um, a factor of each of those values chosen. Next slide. Now um, we're gonna shift to a little bit of a discussion about when I came into the picture um, of looking at these data and what underpinned them. And that has to do with my support of the 2020 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee um, and make, making decisions about the nutrient profile that they were gonna use in food powder modeling for human milk. And the 2020 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee considered that calorie value of 75 kilocalories per 100 milliliters to be too high. Um, the standard reference leg legacy nutrient profile also is pretty high at 70, 40, 74 kilocalories per 100 milliliters. And so they decided not to use it. Um, instead, uh, they decided to use some different values. And the decision not to use the 75 kilocalorie um, value was also further supported by evidence that um, I will show you in a minute that those values were from very early studies of human milk composition from that laboratory of Dr. I.C. Macy from the 1920s. Um, and that's what I'll show next. So instead, the committee chose 68 kilocalories, not quite yet. <laughs> Thanks. The committee chose 68 kilocalories per 100 milliliters to reflect compiled evidence on the metabolizable energy from human milk, citing Riley et al. 2005, which is at the bottom of the slide here, and also to align the contribution of energy from human milk with that of infant formula, because this was for the purposes of food powder modeling exercises. Um, and this value also aligns more closely with the value used in evaluating the DRIs for energy during lactation. All right, next slide. So, this is where the 75 kilocalories per 100 milliliter value um, comes from. First, the DRI reports cite Fahman and Anderson's infant nutrition from 1974 as the reference used for the energy value for human milk of 75 kilocalories. Um, then Fahman and Anderson cite Macy and Kelly, human milk and cow's milk and infant nutrition, 1961. In that publication by Macy and Kelly, table one includes a footnote that cites the National Academies of Sciences, National Research Council 1953 publication, Composition of Milks, a compilation of the comparative compositions and properties of human, cow, and goat milk, colostrum, and traditional milk. And in there, the data on caloric content are cited to be from Macy's 1949 publication, the composition of human milk and colostrum, and then that publication provides a description of the methodology, which at the time was likely the state of the art methodology um, and included about 200 women of diverse socioeconomic status over an ample course of lactation. However, the table providing these data includes a footnote to explain that for energy, the data are from the three publications shown here, Brown et al, 1932, Human Milk Studies 7, Nims et al, Human Milk Studies 10, and both of those are from the laboratories of I.C. Macy. And then a third publication just noted to be data to be published, um, but no other information further specified. And then the subjects in both of the studies that are known were three women. And the unpublished data is currently unknown, but um, I will show you a little bit more about that. So next slide, please. So in the values from Macy's study 1949, those data come back from the Brown and Nims et al. studies. And that's first where we see the publication of the value of about 75 kilocalories per 100 milliliters. It's published as 74.7 plus or minus 9.4 kilocalories with a range of 44.6 to 119.2. So quite a wide range there. Next slide. Now for the two known studies by Brown and Nims et al. from um, IC Macy's lab, um, the participants were selling their milk to the Mother's Milk Bureau of Detroit. And the table one shown here shows that the women um, were ages 25. And then again, that same individual at age 27. Um, and then this other two individuals were 29 and 33 years of age. None were in their first preg pregnancy and their daily milk output was estimated to vary substantially. They were over producers of milk um, with their milk content ranging from between 47 ounces a day um, to 104 ounces today, a day. So they were very much over producers of milk. And these data were collected in 1927 and 1929, respectively. 
with samples taken at 10, 18, 50, and 63 weeks postpartum um, across the different samples for the three women. Next slide, please. So I also wanna note in this table two from Brown et al, 1932, um, on this slide that it shows the caloric values for two subjects were before, below that 75 kilocalorie value. They ranged from 66 to 72 kilocalories. And then that third subject was substantively higher with a range of 84 to 86 kilocalories per 100 milliliters. And the subjects with the lower values had substantially higher milk volumes than the third subject which with, who had um, the higher energy content. Next slide. So I'll, although it's completely not clear, it may be that the unpublished data are from subsequent studies from IC Macy's lab shown here, nutritional status of children, 12 and 13. Um, and so now I'm just gonna share a little bit about the energy value for lactation before I turn it over to Catherine. Next slide, please. So in the 2005 macronutrient report, um, there's a section on milk energy output and it describes as being calculated from milk production and the energy density of human milk, noting that mean milk production rates of the 780 milliliters per day were used for term infants from zero to six months and 600 milliliters per day for infants seven to 12 months, which is the standard approach across the DRI reports um, for infants as well. And then it notes that the energy density of human milk was from bomb calorimetry or approximate macronutrient analysis of representative 24 hour pooled milk samples noted to range in mean values from 0.64 to 0.74 kilocalories per gram. And then the value of 0.67 kilocalories per gram was used in the macronutrient report um, underlying the EER for lactation for adults. And this equates to about 69 kilocalories per 100 milliliters if you're doing that calculation based on the density of 1.93 grams per milliliter. Um, next slide, please. And so these tables um, just show some of the underlying data for that value, um, which are much newer. They um, are much more methodology methodologically rigorous. However, the sample sizes are still small and not representative of the population per se. And I do have a slide here that I'll share with the committee. Go to the next slide that has the references I shared with you today. Um, and I'll turn it over next to Catherine. Next slide, please. So she can talk more with you about looking forward, which is what you were tasked with um, and how human milk data could help you for um, the DRIs that you guys are working on now and in the future. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, uh, thank you for that, Kelly. Um, can everybody, can everybody see and hear me? Yes. yes. Right. Great, thank you. Okay, Ashley, do you mind advancing the slide? Um, so, as Kelly mentioned uh, in in her slides, the existing studies that underpin the energy content and the volume of human milk production that were used in the two thousand and five DRI report are methodologically rigorous but they have a small sample size and are not necessarily representative of the populations of Canada and the United States today um, because they're derived mostly of women who were of a high socioeconomic status and Caucasian. So I'm just gonna walk through some of the reasons why this may or may not be a concern uh, for, for the future DRI reports. Um, so the, the reason for that is that the energy content of human milk is highly variable. So if you look at uh, the panel D here in the, in the figure, this is just showing uh, the energy contents of uh, human milk collected from over 400 subjects. And you can see that it ranges from a low of about 400 uh, kilocalories per liter up to over 1,000. Um, the main macronutrient component that contributes to this variability in the energy content is the, the fat content. Um, so this is, this is one that I'm going to highlight a little bit in this discussion. So um, energy content per se has been less investigated than other macronutrient components in terms of looking at determinants of the variability. Um, however, we do know some factors that can influence it. So that includes things like time postpartum. So we know that immature human milk uh, tends to be uh, lower in fat 
and uh, total energy and proportionately higher in protein. Um, and as the milk matures, then the total fat and energy content rises. Uh, and there is some evidence that with prolonged lactation that this continues to occur so that milk collected from someone who has been lactating for a very long time may be higher in, in total fat. Uh, there's also factors such as socioeconomic status that have been associated with the fat content of human milk. Uh, and BMI. So there was a recent um, systematic review and meta-analysis that found uh, that uh, across the published, published literature uh, that BMI was uh, associated with the total fat content of, of human milk. Uh, this was not significant for the total energy content. However, it was uh, there was a lot of heterogeneity uh, in the studies here. Uh, another, another factor that can influence the energy content of human milk is the volume of production. So with um, very high production of, of human milk, like Kelly mentioned in the case of the, those Icy Macy studies, um, there can be a, a change in the macronutrient and energy content of the human milk. So this tends to be negatively correlated with energy density. And I thought that this was sort of interesting in the context of um, talking about the exclusivity of human milk feeding. So uh, we, we know that we know that of um, women who are breastfeeding, 28% are non-exclusively breastfeeding at one month, and this rises to 47% by five months. So when we're talking about lactating people, um, we're, we're actually talking about people who are exclusively and non-exclusively lactating, which can make a substantial difference in the total volume of the milk that they're producing. Uh, which would influence those, uh, those energy requirement calculations, both from the volume perspective, as well as potentially from the energy density perspective. Uh, and it's estimated that in the case of non-exclusive breastfeeding, this can make a difference of about 300 milliliters per day of production. Um, there's also factors that would influence the infant's uh, intakes of milk and therefore also influence the amount of milk produced, such as the infant's energy requirement, which is uh, affected by their sex and growth rate, which could also um, impact both the volume and the energy content of the milk produced. There's not a lot of literature looking at the role of maternal diet in modulating uh, human milk energy content. However, there's one study that suggested that a high fat diet may be associated with a higher milk content. Um, also importantly, ethnicity and genetic factors also likely play a role. Um, however, these have been poorly investigated. So we know that there are a lot of factors that can influence the energy content of human milk, but how large of an influence do they have? So in the, the case of BMI, um, it's, estimated that, um, it's estimated that it would be about a seven calorie per liter difference per one point increase in BMI. So if we're talking about the difference between someone uh, with a BMI of 24 in the normal weight category and someone with a BMI of 30 in the obese category, we're really talking about a difference of about five kilocalories per hundred milliliters or plugged into those um, energy requirement calculations for lactation, about 35 kilocalories. So this might sort of be within the acceptable range of error um, that, that we're willing to accept for these, these types of calculations. Um, in contrast, factors that affect the volume of human milk produced might actually have a larger impact on the, those energy requirement calculations. So in the example I gave earlier of um, non-exclusive breastfeeding, which can affect the volume of milk produced by um, 300 milliliters, then we'd be talking about, uh, if we plug that into those calculations, we'd, we'd be talking about a difference of up to 200 kilocalories, which might be something that's significant. Um, can, we, uh, can we move on to the next slide? Thank you. Um, so I think Ashley's gonna touch on this a little bit uh, more just at the end, um, but there is, a, uh, there, there is a, a scoping review that our group is conducting. And I apologize, there's an error on the slide where it says we're conducting this with NASA, but we're actually not. <laughs> so I apologize for that. Um, but so there's a scoping review that our group is conducting that it's going to be looking uh, for sources of literature for updating human milk composition tables. Um, this is going to include manuscripts that have kilocalorie data for human milk from the United States and Canada. Uh, and we're expecting that this will uh, be completed uh, in October 2023. So um, we'll, we'll have some information on more published literature that has come out um, since. But I did also want to share with you uh, a couple of upcoming unpublished studies that may also be uh, of interest in, in um, 
in developing the DRI values. Do you mind, can we go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, so these are two large international studies that are being conducted of human milk composition. Uh, one is IMIC, the um, International Milk Composition Consortium, and the other one is MILK, M-I-L-Q. Uh, and these are both expected to be reporting within the next one to two years. So um, in the case of IMIC, it includes uh, 1,200 dyads from uh, Tanzania, Pakistan, Burkina Faso, and Canada. And the, the Canadian subjects include 400 subjects from the child cohort. Um, importantly, the, the, the methods that are used to uh, assess the energy content of the milk would not be considered gold standard methods. So um, it would be a approximate uh, macronutrient composition used to estimate energy content. Um, and it, not a full 24 hour full expression type study, uh, which, which the, the previous studies used in the DR have been used. So um, in terms of the absolute values of energies, it, it, it may not be as influential, but where I think these studies can be um, valuable is that they are uh, very large studies and they're a multi-ethnic cohort with very detailed demographic data. So I think that they'll help to elucidate um, some more of those factors that I mentioned previously that can influence the energy content of human milk um, and will sort of tell us uh, how big of an impact um, not necessarily having a representative sample can have. So that's the case of IMEC. Um, in the case of, of milk, it's also an international uh, multi-ethnic cohort. So there's 250 subjects each from Bangladesh, Brazil, Denmark, and the Gambia. Um, the goal of this study is actually to establish reference ranges for nutrients and to investigate the variability in the levels of these nutrients. Um, so uh, it has some, some uh, full, full breast expression and there's uh, four time points of milk that are collected. Of particular interest perhaps to the DRI committee is they're going to be collecting information on the volume of milk produced. So uh, in the cases of Bangladesh, Brazil, and the Gambia, they'll be doing that using mother to child deuterium transfer. Um, and in the case of Denmark, they'll be using 24 hour test weighing. So these are both considered good, um, good methods for measuring uh, the volume of human milk produced. Um, they're going to be measuring the macronutrients by a mid infrared analyzer. So again, this would be sort of approximate energy uh, content that could be calculated as opposed to uh, the, the bomb calorimetry method. Um, but, but yeah, so, so these two studies that are coming out, we're, we're quite excited about in the HMCI because they, we think that they're going to give us a lot more information on the nutrient content of the human milk, but also the sources of the variability that can influence uh, the composition of human milk in these large cohorts. Um, so can we go to the next slide? And I think Ashley is going to tell just a little bit about some other initiatives that the HMCI is uh, is conducting that can that might support the the DRI's efforts. Sure, thanks, Catherine. So we started with um, all the reasons why the data has been challenging and challenged, and hopefully we gave you some potential new options for data resources that Catherine just mentioned. And then we're hoping to give you some hope for the future that uh, we do we do have some um, things on the horizon. So uh, Catherine already mentioned our scoping review that we're doing in partnership with the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. And so we should, by um, October of this year, have a list of publications that have um, kilocalorie per you know, 100 mLs of human milk data. Um, again, this is published literature uh, by, by this October from the US and Canadian populations, if that is of interest to this group. We won't have a systematic review, but we'll have the list of publications. Um, and then the other thing I wanna mention is that my institute um, last fall cleared a scientific concept called primordial, which stands for prevention research from human milk which of course is the key word here, to origins of disease and development in the life course, uh, which includes a, a deep dive into human milk. And so um, we're awaiting for availability, availability of funds for this research. It wouldn't start you know, until fiscal year 23 at the very earliest, but we wanted to just let you know that that was, that was on the horizon and that we recognize that um, it's difficult to get perfect data and we're um, working with what we have and we're hoping to do better in the future. Back to you, Catherine. Great, thank you. Um, so just to conclude my section, the um, I think we've shown that the energy content of human milk is variable, uh, that parent and influent characteristics likely do affect the energy content of human milk, but that more research really is needed to understand the scale of the impact of these factors 
on the human milk energy content um, and really identifying which factors might be most important to control for. Uh, new studies that are going to be reporting in the next two years might provide us some valuable information to answer some of these questions, uh, both about the volume of human milk production, as well as sources of variability in the macronutrient composition uh, in large multi-ethnic cohorts. Um, so I think with that, then uh, we'd like to thank you and um, we're pleased to take any questions. Thank you very much for that um, presentation. Um, I see I have questions from, from Dr. Lynch and um, Dr. Susan Roberts. Dr. Lynch, do you want to go first? Yeah, thank, thank you very much for this. Uh, this is a, I've seen these already. It's very, uh, very interesting, a great find, uh, Kelly, tracking this uh, stuff back. The, um, so if the, you know, we've been hearing now that uh, from a lot of review papers that the third most abundant component in human milk are milk oligosaccharides which can't be used by the host for energy, but since they're oligosaccharides contain energy. And so if, um, if uh, one had used in the 1920s bomb calorimetry to determine the energy value of milk and a third, you know, and there was this big, huge component of it that couldn't be used for the host as energy, but could be used by the bomb calorimeter. You know, you know I guess that really supports this idea that maybe the value was, too high, and we should use other approaches to term like the just uh, you know measuring the lactose and fat and determining the energy from what we know about the energy value of of those of lipid and um, you know digestible sugars. That's a question. Yeah, I think that's a really I think that's a really good point, and there is a push to express human milk energy content as metabolizable energy as opposed to total energy for that exact reason. Um, I, I think what's sort of interesting to think about in the context of the lactational DRIs is that um, for the lactation, we care more about the energy it takes the mom to produce the milk than the energy it's providing to the infant. So I maybe in that case, the bomb calorimeter is not uh, or the potential overestimation isn't that big of a problem just because um, the, those components still had to be produced and put into the, the human milk. But yeah, I think that's a really important consideration. Yeah, this is Kelly. I'll just add on to that, um, that it is essential to know what the energy content is that an infant's going to receive from the human milk, but it would not make sense to assume that energy content that an infant receives from the human milk is the same amount of energy that's required by the woman to make the milk. So if you if we're using similar numbers for the energy content of human milk for the DRIs for infants as is used for the DRI for lactation, which is what the data, um, the data shows that there's actually a higher number for infants that's been used historically, the 75 kilocalories versus a lower number, 69 for lactation. It should be the opposite. We should have a number that's higher for lactation that's used because she has to produce all these extra things um, and the store, that all has to come from, from her. So, you know, logically, it makes sense that you would have a value for the infant DRIs that is, that is lower than the value used to underpin um, the energy needs during lactation. And that's not the case currently. Thank you. Susan Roberts? Susan? Uh, I, want, yeah, I wanted to uh, follow up. My question is re relevant to this, what Chris was mentioning, which is alternative methods for measuring the energy content of human milk. And, you know, the full expression method, you know, comes with all its, all the assumptions in there. But I think in theory, if you have a measurement of total energy expenditure by doubly labeled water from the baby, that automatically comes with a, a measurement of fluid intake um, from the deuterium, the rate of deuterium disappearance. So in a fully breastfed infant, if you've got body composition or weight change over the measurement period, I think you could back calculate the energy content of the fluid that was consumed. And it might give you an alternative way to, to get a fix on the average calorie requirement. And we're collecting all of this doubly labeled water data um, for the energy requirements. So, so some of the numbers that could be used for that are actually gonna be available in this committee, just a thought. Thank you, Janet. Yeah, um, 
thank you all for the talk. I thought it was uh, really interesting and informative. I did have one specific question. I wanted to ask you if you know where the kilocalorie value that's used for um, FNDDS uh, with the NHANES nutrient data for human milk, if you know where that uh, comes from. Yeah, I, I can answer that. So we've done a lot of sleuthing. ARS has done a lot of sleuthing and the answer is no. <laughs> There's no documentation that can be found um, other than which ones are calculated from other values and such. We don't have the references for that. Um, some of the references in that profile for other nutrients come from cow's milk, um, but for energy, um, we don't know where that value came from. Okay, great. I mean, not great, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but my guess is it's a similar, It's a, because it's so similar to the DRIs, which is what we found also for the mean concentration in that profile of nutrients being similar to the DRIs, that they're similar, that they, they could be um, similar data sets um, that were just used slightly differently to come up with slightly different values, but we expect it to be as dated um, as the data used for the DRIs. Okay. Beth Yetley? And this yeah, will be thanks. the last question. Okay, thank you. It was a very interesting report and I'm glad to see that the several agencies are working on human milk composition issues. It was always a <clears throat> much needed focus. I'm just wondering if, if and how you would see the energy DRIs for infants as useful in what you're doing or in how the agencies regulate uh, the composition of infant formulas. And if so, what kinds of information would you find useful? That's a good question. I mean, I think these values relate more to um, their use in um, establishing the energy requirements during lactation for your purposes. Um, and then thinking forward to updating DRIs for infants and having more modern data to underpin those. Um, at that time, and I think when we do have more robust data on, on, on the total composition of human milk, energy and nutrients and other things as well, um, you know, those, those publications would be able to inform you know, future decisions perhaps about infant formula um, and complementary feeding in addition to human milk as a source of energy, but I think it's too premature now to, to really think about that yet. Yeah, I can comment a little bit on this because my group at Health Canada evaluates um, infant formulas. Um, so there's there, there are uh, required compositional requirements for infant formulas in Canada and the United States that the formulas have to meet. Um, and uh, having new information and better information and more representative information that reflects the diversity of the Canadian and American populations would certainly be useful uh, in any future regulatory modernization efforts where we might be revisiting some of those numbers. So, so definitely there's interest within, within our group of infant formula regulators in, um, in seeing some, some, new, some new numbers for the, um, the, the energy, but as well also the, uh, the nutrient content of human milk uh, coming out. Thank you, everybody, for your questions. I'm going to need to let Le um, Dr. Leanne Redman do her presentation because we're going to run out of time otherwise. So um, Leanne, please take over. I'll do that. Are you seeing it? Yep. I was like, I thought I lost everyone for a minute. For some reason, I <laughs> gone away. I did. All right. Well, um, good afternoon, and um, thanks for having me. And I'm really glad that we got to have this additional session after all, because now having the um, the breast milk piece and the um, the pregnancy piece going together makes a lot of sense. So I'm going to be speaking about the energy requirements to support pregnancy, weight gain, and lactation at varying BMIs. And I want to start by thanking several of the people in the room because many of you were part of the um, committee that, that synthesized the evidence and put together the 2005 DRI report. Chapter five on energy is a Bible in our, in our laboratory, actually. It's got numerous highlights and um, 
post-its all through it and it's been something that we've thought about a long time since it was published. So my charge today is to start us off there, thinking about where we were in 2005, um, some of the gaps that existed in the recommendations at that time, um, what's new and then where can we go from here? So I'm just gonna start by reminding everybody uh, what you all put in the report. So in 2005, the DRI report uh, from the Institute of Medicine defined estimated energy requirements or the EER as the average energy intake that is predicted to maintain energy balance in a healthy adult of defined age, gender, weight, height, and level of physical activity, which is consistent with good health. Then of course, in pregnant or lactating women, the ERI then includes the needs associated with the deposition of tissues or the secretion of milk at rates consistent with good health. So to calculate the estimated energy requirement, prediction equations for normal weight individuals were developed from data um, using total daily energy expenditure or TE or TDE measured by the doubly labeled water technique. So for pregnant women, a lot has changed uh, since the 2005 report. And I'll review this briefly and the information since then. And I've got a few things that I would like for the panel to consider and hopefully we have time to discuss. So in 2005, uh, the W labeled um, water database on pregnant women that the committee were able to consider included four studies. And of note, those studies uh, were obtained um, in individuals um, who were defined as being well nourished or with a body mass index between 18.5 and 25, so normal weight individuals. And um, these studies showed that the change in TDEE across gestation ranged from a reduction in TE from minus 57 calories per week through to an increase of 107 calories per week. And the committee determined that the median change in TEE was eight calories per week of gestation. And that is what they used in the calculation. They also found that the change in TEE at the time was not related to maternal age, to pre-pregnancy weight, pre-pregnancy BMI, or weight gain or loss during pregnancy. Now that could be due to the limited number of studies that were included at that time, which it says here there were four, but um, those are important uh, things to consider. So to equate the energy requirement needed to support growth of maternal and fetal tissue, the committee also used empirical data uh, on the longitudinal changes in body composition across pregnancy and the energy equivalents uh, for protein and fat were assumed to be 5.6 calories per day for protein or fat free mass deposition uh, and 9.5 calories uh, per day for fat mass deposition. And these are historical estimates of, of Heighton and Chamberlain and they're still relevant um, today. So the evaluation of body composition included a few additional studies. There were nine studies that were included in these estimates. And once again, these studies were defined to be coming from individuals who were well nourished and normal weight um, and pregnant, obviously. And the study showed that the mean gain in fat mass for these uh, women was 3.7 kilos and the committee determined that that resulted in a mean energy deposition of around 180 calories per day. So I'm showing the equation now. So the, the estimated energy requirement for pregnancy in 2005 was derived from the sum of the energy requirement in the non-pregnant state. So that's the equation uh, shown here uh, at the top. Um, and then they added to that the mean change of the TEE uh, across weeks of gestation and the energy deposition uh, of pregnancy. So in the first trimester, um, the committee determined that there was no changes in uh, TEE or energy deposition. 
So it would be the energy requirement of the non-pregnant woman uh, um, that would carry over in the first trimester. So the recommendation was for zero uh, increases in calories there. And in the second trimester, the recommendation came out at 340 calories per day in addition. Um, and in the third trimester, that increased to 450 calories per day. So several people uh, took the recommendations to heart, which was great. And uh, the, the 2005 DRI uh, recommendations were noted by the 2009 Institute of Medicine Committee who re-examined guidelines for appropriate weight gain in pregnancy. And the IOM committee recognized that the DRI for energy at the time were for women having normal weight at the time of pregnancy. And they also went on to state that for women with overweight or obesity, they may indeed need fewer calories. But that has been um, a major gap uh, for uh, our, this field uh, since that time. So since then, um, you know, there are new things to consider. We need to take a look at the 2009 Institute of Medicine recommendations for weight gain in pregnancy, and we'll do that in a second. And we're going to use those recommendations to understand um, the prevalence of um, appropriate weight gain in pregnancy, as well as excess weight gain in pregnancy. Um, I'm going to share some new data that we've collected since uh, 2005 pertaining to pregnant individuals with obesity. And I also want to challenge the group to start thinking about um, more diverse recommendations, such as for people with non-white uh, race. So as a brief uh, reminder um, of the um, IOM's recommendations for appropriate weight gain in pregnancy, those are shown here. And the IOM um, in their report determined that weight gain um, recommendations were required for each uh, BMI class, recognizing that there's an inverse association between pre-pregnancy BMI and weight gain in pregnancy. What you will note is that the weight gain requirements for individuals become more stringent the heavier the person is at the time of conception. So if we think just about the 2005 uh, recommendation here, which focused on normal weight women, um, you can see that the IOM would recommend, uh, did recommend 11.5 to 16 kilograms of weight gain. Whereas for uh, individuals entering pregnancy with obesity, the recommendation was for five to nine kilos. And it's important to note that these recommendations were um, selected based on the association of excess weight gain with adverse pregnancy outcomes. So as you'd imagine, there's been quite a lot of interest in uh, the field to understand, you know, how women are adopting these guidelines um, or not. And since the 2009 report, there have been a large number of epidemiological studies published to understand these guidelines and, their com and the compliance to them. So there's an overwhelming evidence that not all people adhere to the weight gain recommendations of the IOM. And importantly, that adherence to these guidelines is different for individuals with different BMI class. So what I'm showing you here in just one example is um, US-based data from the Maternal Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. Now, this is, might be argued as being fairly old now, but it's still one of the most recent ones from 2016. So if you just look in the first column, this is summarizing the information here for all women um, in this year. And it was showing um, that only 30% of all women actually achieve the weight gain that is recommended by the Institute of Medicine report from 2009. But it's an important consideration for the committee because remember the 2005 EER recommendation from this group was focused on normal weight women, first of all. And second of all, it was including all women regardless of the amount of weight that they gained in pregnancy. So the reason that that's important is because this issue of, um, sorry, of um, 
of appropriate weight gain changes, the heavier a woman is at, at the time she enters pregnancy. So you can see here that for women who have overweight or have obesity at the time of pregnancy, only about 20% of these women are likely to achieve the recommended weight gain target and the majority, so two out of three women, will actually experience uh, weight gain above the Institute of Medicine recommendation, or we've referred to that as excess weight gain in pregnancy. And the reason why this is really important for us to think about is that weight gain in pregnancy is associated with the gain in fat mass. And of course, it's the energy deposition in fat that is, is driving a lot of the EER uh, computation and ultimate recommendation. Now, this is data here that um, Nancy Butte shared with me uh, at some point in time, I can't remember when, but it's to show you using the data that she collected in a large sample of women with underweight, normal weight, overweight, and obesity, um, that there is a stronger correlation between fat mass in the solid line and total weight gain in pregnancy. Of course, there is also an association with protein deposition or fat mass gain, but not to the same um, degree. The next example I'm gonna show you is actually using data from um, the body composition information included in the 2009, uh, excuse me, the 2005 DRI report. And these data are coming from Sally Lederman. And so, um, here I've got it, she classified um, weight gain and fat mass gain for each of the different BMI classes. These are based on the old insurance table scale because um, it's an older paper. But to make the point that when a woman goes from having recommended weight gain to um, weight gain above the recommendations, what you are seeing is an increase in fat mass. And that's consistent across each BMI class. So we spent quite a lot of work um, in our lab over the past um, 10 years studying um, in an observational fashion, uh, pregnant women with, obes with obesity. And what I'm showing you here is in this um, exclusive cohort of women with obesity, first of all, a waterfall plot, which is the black uh, dots here ranked from the least amount of weight gain to the most amount of weight gain across pregnancy. The three bars at the top here reflect the Institute of Medicine um, category. So there's 36 women here, two thirds with excess gain. Um, then you see the women with the recommended gain and women that would be considered to have inadequate gain. And I'm doing this to just illustrate the point once again that this relationship with fat mass gain and gestational weight gain, it exists also in women with obesity. So it's on a continuum with BMI. So the women who gain the least amount of weight, they actually lost fat mass. It's really interesting in women with obesity. Um, but of course, as weight gain um, increases and is above the Institute of Medicine guideline, you can see that that is being attributed to an increased gain in fat mass. So this study that I did in these women was really set out to understand uh, the energy requirements of women with obesity within different um, obesity classes and to uh, understand this in the context of the Institute of Medicine guidelines. So we did um, a doubly labeled water study at the beginning of pregnancy and at the end of pregnancy. And we took the mean in TEE across pregnancy we also did measurements of body composition at the beginning of pregnancy and at the end. Um, we used a three compartment model. We used the total body water from the DLW study in addition to density from the air displacement plus seismography to compute the change in energy intake across pregnancy for these women. And on the basis of whether they gained below the Institute of Medicine recommendation within or in excess. And so if you look at the women with the recommended weight gain, according to IOM, so these are women with 11 um, to 20 pounds or five to nine kilos of weight gain. These women on average um, were eating less than their total daily energy expenditure. They were in a daily negative energy balance of about 125 calories per day. So that's really interesting. And it's only the women who had excess weight gain, so weight gain above nine kilograms, 
that were eating more than they were expending. And, um, and on average, about 180 calories per day. And you're probably wondering, well, but was this healthy? And like, what about the baby? So I'm showing you the figure here. You saw it before in terms of the different compartments of body composition. We already talked on the previous slide with the waterfall plot about the fat mass gain by IOM class. But I wanted to show you that you know, fetal growth was not compromised. This was a, as I said, a prospective observational study. There's about 50% of the cohort were black, but there's no difference here um, in fetal size. So what are the implications for not focusing energy requirement estimates on appropriate weight gain within each BMI class? So I wanted to illustrate this. Um, what you may or may not know is that following the DRI report, uh, Nancy Butte and I, we found a very amazing partnership in Diana Thomas. Professor Thomas uh, is at West Point, but she wasn't at the time, she was at Montclair State. But we uh, worked with Diana to develop a dynamic energy balance model um, using the doubly labeled water and body composition data that was included in the DRI report so that we could um, use a woman's um, age, her pre-gravid BMI and her weight gain throughout pregnancy to estimate how many calories that she would need to eat in each trimester of pregnancy to adhere to the IOM guidelines. And we've actually used this model to be the basis of um, intervention studies now where we can prescribe dietary intake to women. But what I wanted to show you is that if you look specifically for women with overweight and obesity, um, which came from uh, Nancy Butte's study, 100% of those women experienced excess weight gain. So what does that do when we're trying to make estimates for women and we compare it to a measure of total daily energy intake uh, by doubly labeled water, um, which is what we did in our study? So in the women that we studied, we computed the model generated estimate um, of their uh, energy intake throughout pregnancy, and we compared it to what we actually measured. And you can see that when we don't get this right, what happens is that we can derive energy um, requirement estimates that are going to be over estimating what a woman needs in pregnancy. And if you remember from the previous slide, you know, we saw that on average, women with excess weight gain were eating only 180 calories a day in addition. So being off by, you know, another 100 here in our estimates could only drive more excess weight gain. So the next consideration that I wanted to make is in relation to trying to see if we have enough data to think about diversity of our recommendations. And these are the data um, coming from, again, the study that we conducted. And we were fortunate to recruit a sample of around 50% white and non-white women. And what I'm showing you is um, probably not a surprising relationship outside the context of pregnancy, but we hadn't um, had data to look at this in pregnancy before. But um, individuals um, who are black have consistently lower rates of energy expenditure per kilogram of their metabolic mass in comparison to their white counterparts. And this is when you, whether you look at it in an unadjusted fashion or whether you adjust it here for um, other things, fat mass, fat free mass, age, and, and so forth. And it's not only in the doubly labeled water measurement, it's also in sedentary measurements. So this is sleeping energy expenditure here. And I wanted to show you that it's not related to differences in physical activity. So this is a physiological difference that we know in the literature that exists between black and non, um, and non black people. So if we don't have enough data to consider individuals who are not white, um, we need to be cognizant of how we're going to address that in the report because we're further, um, because individuals who are black have lower levels of energy expenditure. When we use these models, um, our estimated energy requirement equation that you guys will come up with or models that come from that later, the delta here between the model prediction or the EER and actual is only going to get larger. So we could actually you know, run the risk of inducing um, some more disparities here for um, non-white women. 
So I'm going to pivot now the last couple of slides to lactation. So um, where we were in 2005, the 2005 report for lactation included five studies in lactating people from one to six months postpartum. And it's important to note that those individuals were exclusively breastfeeding and all of normal weight. And the, um, the committee determined at the time, we heard in the previous slide, that the EER for lactating individuals would be the, um, the total daily energy expenditure derived from doubly labeled water, plus the, the milk energy output. And we would take into consideration energy that's mobilized from uh, changes to the, the individual's uh, body fat stores across that period of exclusive lactation. So these were the two recommendations um, that were, uh, were provided at the time. So we have the um, estimated energy requirement for non-lactating and non-pregnant adults. We're adding in 500 calories for milk production, and we're also taking into account 170 ki ki um, kilocalories coming from a loss of fat mass from birth to six months. And then we're assuming that everyone reaches postpartum um, weight loss by six months. So there's no bonus for additional fat loss um, from six to 12 months. So things to consider uh, since 2005, and we heard some of this before, um, but that is that, you know, what are we looking at in terms of exclusive versus non-exclusive lactation? So I'm providing just one example here. There are many statistics on this, but you can see from the CDC breastfeeding report card that um, exclusive breastfeeding through six months is um, occurring only in about one fourth of uh, lactating people. Um, and the second relates to um, excess weight gain in pregnancy. So, um, and the impact on postpartum weight retention. I already told you that one of the major contributors to excess gestational weight gain in pregnancy is the accretion of maternal fat mass. And if on average, the, the gain in fat mass is three kilograms by the end of pregnancy, and we can equate our energy coefficient of 9.5 calories per gram, you know, the individual is, has the potential to store an additional 33,000 calories in adipose tissue that could be mobilized for lactation. I also wanted to make a note here is that um, there's been studies conducted, say by Dr. Cheryl Lovelady, for instance, that have showed that a 500 calorie per day energy deficit during lactation for um, in individuals with overweight and obesity does not impact um, milk production, but it does support a return to pre-gravid weight. So in our trial um, of doubly labeled water and energy balance in pregnant women with obesity, we followed them until one year postpartum. And I wanted to share with you the large degree of weight change that you see in the postpartum period and so here is all women that we were able to follow through 12 months postpartum. There were 37 women. Um, on average for this cohort, they gained 8.2 kilograms in their pregnancy. Um, so they were within the five to nine kilograms here of IOM on average. Um, in the postpartum period, they lost 6.4 kilograms, which means that they retained 1.8 kilos by 12 months postpartum. So they did not return to their pre-pregnancy weight at six months, and they still had not returned to their pre-pregnancy weight uh, by 12 months postpartum. Uh, this is consistent with the Life Mums cohort, which was a cohort of uh, 1,200 uh, overweight and obese women in the US where the postpartum weight retention at one year was 2.2 kilos. But what we did here is that we divided the groups into women that had postpartum weight gain and those that had postpartum weight loss. So postpartum weight loss occurred in 43% of these women. So 57% experienced weight gain. So what did this look like in terms of their change in energy intake from the pregnancy to 12 months postpartum? And so I'm showing you that here. Um, for both those groups. So for the women who experienced postpartum weight loss, they had re reduced their energy intake from pregnancy by approximately 350 calories per day from birth 
through six months, and then um, 327 calories per day from six to 12 months. But this is in contrast to the individuals who experience postpartum uh, weight retention and even weight gain, as you can see in the chart. These um, individuals actually were increasing their energy intake of around, uh, if we average at about 250 calories per day. So I'm gonna wrap up um, by saying, you know, we all appreciate that pregnancy is an energy costly process. Um, we also appreciate that the estimated energy requirements are different for gestation and they should consider um, pre-gravid body size in, their, in the calculations. Um, the DRI from 2005 did not find an association between TDE, and I mentioned all those things, pre-gravid weight, pre-gravid BMI age, but the studies at the time were small. So I'm hoping that, you know, for the next report, we can align our recommendations with BMI categories and, if possible, obesity class. Um, so the new studies of pregnant women with obesity suggest that these individuals do not need to increase caloric intake in pregnancy to achieve the 2009 Institute of Medicine recommendations. And for lactating individuals in the US, we all know they're not doing so exclusively. So I hope we can consider this in the revised um, or the updated EERs for lactating individuals. We also need to consider um, the excess weight in pregnancy um, and how that's being retained, not only at six months, but also at one year and how we can factor this in to the recommendation for lactating people. And of course, a gentle reminder that the postpartum period is often the pre-gravid period for the next pregnancy and that calorie deficits may be needed um, for individuals who experienced excess weight gain, regardless of BMI, or those individuals with overweight and obesity to prepare them for the next birth and pregnancy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leanne. That was a very informative presentation. Um, and I know we have questions, but we also have a short period of time, but I wanna make sure that the committee has time to ask the questions. And I'm gonna ask one of the first questions because I know it's gonna come up. So you describe differences in the, um, the estimated energy requirements between black and white women, but you do not tell us beyond physical activity as well as weight status, what was different between these two groups? So did you measure diet composition? Did you measure environmental stimuli for these particular individuals, um, understanding where they came from? And do you have any information on um, genetics? First, uh, I'll... excellent question. And I have a lot of comprehensive phenotyping information on these women, and we can get into that. Now, the evidence I was showing was for total daily energy expenditure for, for regardless of intake. And so that would only be slightly impacted by diet and diet quality, right? Once I factor in the body composition change and get energy intake, yes, we need to take diet composition into account. I don't have genetic information um, <laughs> on them, but I do have diet information and we can, we can look at that. I, we computed healthy eating index, for instance, so we know those things. Um, but the differences exist beside, aside from the normal expected adjustments, right? Differences in parity between the women and so forth. Now, I know Susan and I see you know, Dr. Wong here and Others, I mean, we've known that um, individuals who are black have a lower energy expenditure per kilogram of metabolic mass than white individuals outside the context of pregnancy. Um, we just published it and saw it here in, in the context of pregnancy. Thank you. Other questions from committee members? Hi. Hi, um, I thought one of your slides, um, one of the last slides you showed was really fascinating in terms of continued weight gain after pregnancy, that the proportion of that, you know, we, we all know that when you gain weight, there's a proportion that's fat mass and a proportion that's fat free mass and usually it's about 80 to 20%, but it looked like from your slide 
that lean mass was pretty much maintained stable during that six postpartum six and 12 month periods, but a massive gain in fat mass was even more than what would be expected. And I wonder if you've you know, looked at that proportion of fat to lean gain in that postpartum period and what might be driving greater accretion of fat mass in the postpartum period as in proportion to lean mass than one would normally expect in a weight gain state. Mm -hmm. And excellent question. You know, I think that there's, I mean, first of all, it's really sad to see, you know, this kind of data. And it was, it's really sad to work with the people in these sorts of studies too, um, especially when we weren't intervening because it was observational. Um, you know, there are a number of factors that are driving the weight gain, right? You know, we should be in, an, in an, a period of drastic weight loss. And I do think that the non-exclusive lactation is a major factor. And many individuals don't even experience that initial weight loss following birth. And I think in, in women with obesity, it's very different. And especially in women with class three obesity. So these are individuals with a BMI above 50. You know, they were losing fat mass. They all, every woman with a BMI above 50 lost fat mass in the third trimester of pregnancy, everyone. And it, that's amazing. And then as soon as they deliver their baby, then their weight gain now starts to come back on. Now, what's driving that? I think part of it is the non-exclusive lactation. Um, there are other factors which don't sort of pertain to this group, but a lot of it is requiring to turn to work and socio, you know, economic situations that are affecting their, just their livelihood and their physiology. Thank you. The whole presentation was excellent, Leanne. Thank you. Susan Barr and then Nancy Butte. Uh, thanks for a wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed it. Learned a lot. Uh, just had a quick question. Um, do you have any data on other race ethnic ethnicity groups, for example, Asians, South Asians, and whether there are uh, differences on um, energy metabolism uh, in those in those groups? Mm -hmm. um, I don't have enough of a sample size to derive estimates for other groups. I think it's really important. Amy Luke might have some, um, but in non-pregnant individuals, but we can certainly, um, I'm well acquainted with the IAEA group and we can certainly understand what cohort studies that they have going on internationally now. Um, my team has actually gone overseas for the IAEA to train people on some of these methods. So I know that there are studies underway. So maybe there are data that we could derive for your exercise. Hey, Nancy. Thank you. Nancy? Um, yeah, just, I might've missed this, but um, I think you said your sample size is, was 37. And I was wondering if you could describe for us, what are the classes of obesity in your cohort? Mm -hmm. um, and then the second part of my question is, um, I think the most controversial thing that you um, said in your summary um, is that the obese women during pregnancy don't need to increase energy intake. Um, and I know you're fully aware that this would be contrary to the, the IOM report on weight gain during pregnancy. Um, that was, um, we debated that for a, a lot of time, looked at the evidence and the as you know, it was concluded that um, some, some should be recommended, of course, less. Um, so could you comment on those two things? Yep. Um, so the original study was to enroll 75 individuals. We enrolled 72 individuals. The number that I mentioned was those that we could follow all the way to one year. Mm -hmm. At the end of pregnancy, individuals with complete data, so two doubly labeled waters and the two body composition assessments, we have 53 individuals in the JCI paper. Mm -hmm. I can share all the raw data and it is in the IAEA database. Um, so, and they were roughly divided between three obesity classes. So class one or grade one is between 30 and 35 BMI. And then grade two is from 36 to 40. And then grade three, we call 40 and above. 
So we had roughly one third women in within each of those. Okay. And do you see differences in by class of obesity in your conclusions? Yes. So for the main outcome, which was to derive these estimates of intake across pregnancy, we included everybody together. But for changes in body composition and then energy deposition by trimester, we do see differences by BMI class. I will share the body composition paper with you. Um, it's in obesity, but it is different. Like the individuals with the highest BMI all lose fat mass in the third trimester of pregnancy. They mm -hmm. all do. They mobilize lipids. Um, mm -hmm. They have an increase in fat oxidation. Um, and so it seems that the energy that is being stored early and the existing energy pool of the mother is able to be mobilized effectively to support the fetal growth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I know it goes against what we were thinking. And, um, you know, based on, on these data and that study, I have new research underway to it's a proof of concept study with Dr. Suzanne Phelan, and we are trying to get individuals with obesity to maintain weight in pregnancy. And it's proof of concept because we're doing a controlled feeding study. And um, we are having very careful measurements with ultrasound of fetal growth each month. Mm -hmm. um, but we do believe based on the data that for those women with recommended and even inadequate weight gain, they certainly were eating in an energy deficit state. Mm -hmm. I think one of the problems in both of these committees, both for the weight gain and now for energy intake, um, there probably is a physiological difference of what's occurring in an obese class three versus a obese class one. And what the dilemma is when you come down to making recommendations that the sample sizes get quite small. Um, if we now divide this between the white and black, um, the different classes of obesity, we're gonna end up with a very small sample size. Um, and so I think that many times the committees go for the side of, of safety um, with, without more data. Um, and I'm afraid we're gonna encounter the same limitations with the currently available data. Um, I'm not a, a bit surprised that fat is mobilized during the, the third trimester in, in your sample. It's even observed in normal weight women. Um, mm -hmm. So that is certainly physiologically phys feasible and, and most likely occurs to a greater extent in these very obese women. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we'll just have to um, yeah. look at the data and, and see how, how much we can what, what we, can, we, we can recommend. Right. And of note, you know, we are not studying women with grade one or class one in our new trial. And uh -huh. part of that is because, you know, often we don't see women pre-pregnant. You know, we see them at some point in the first trimester and you can never be certain on what they weighed before. And mm -hmm. so there's a risk of putting them in the wrong, you know, class. So we were deliberately started, Suzanne and I, at 30, 35 for our new weight maintenance trial. Yeah. And Leanne, I can verify we have a cohort that is with NICHD called the PEAS cohort that indeed as well, we've seen obesity, um, women with obesity actually decreasing their fat mass, um, you know, throughout pregnancy because we've measured them using anthropometric techniques um, throughout the course of pregnancy in the postpartum period. So that's, that's something that's true. But I think once again, as, as Nancy has um, sort of iterated is the fact that whenever we make these recommendations at the National Academy, we always follow the recommendation, we always follow the principle of do no harm because we had a lot of push in the 2009 report to actually say that pregnant women, obese pregnant women should not gain any weight. And then what you do is you negate the fact that the fetus itself is going to be, you know, contributing to weight and there's different sort of um, plasma volume and different other changes throughout the course of pregnancy that are also occurring. So we need to be very careful and obviously with more well done studies such as yours to be able to understand both what's happening to the mom and what's happening to the fetus so that we can provide adequate guidelines. I'm going to have to end here because we need at least 10 minutes for our committee to deliberate, but I want to thank everybody. I really want to thank our speakers today for giving us wonderful information and thank you for being a part of this. Appreciate it. Thank you. We're now going to go into closed session. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank